Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Vanderbilt University's 2014 Senior Class Day. Please welcome to the stage the President of Vanderbilt Alumni Association, Carol Kimball. The President of Vanderbilt Student Government, Isaac Escamilla. <laughs> Chancellor Nicholas Zeppos. And our 2014 Senior Class Day speaker, Dr. Regina Benjamin. Good morning. It's my privilege to welcome you all to the 2014 Senior Day celebration. As we stand at this important transition, I'd like to share briefly with you a word from Southern Africa popularized by the Archbishop Desmond Tutu. That word is Ubuntu, which roughly translates to, I am what I am because of who we all are. The reason I bring this up is because I think here at Vanderbilt, uh, it's easy for us to divide ourselves into groups. Those that studied engineering and those that studied economics. Those that lived in McGill and those that lived in Towers. Those that joined a fraternity and those that didn't. It's not quite as bad as Mean Girls, but you know what I mean. But at the end of the day, when we define ourselves only in these defined groups, we lose sight of what it really means to be Vanderbilt. At the end of the day, every single one of us here shares a common bond. And that bond is something that transcends all of that. In the 1870s, Cornelius Vanderbilt founded this very university to rediscover a similar bond that exists between all parts of our nation, despite the wounds inflicted by the Civil War. It's that bond that I feel incredibly lucky to share with each of you today. And because of that bond that I can say that I, for one, I am what I am because of who we all are. With that in mind, I'd next like to introduce four of our fellow students who will be um, sharing some remarks on this special day inspired by their religious traditions. Those students are Shilpa Mokshagundam from Hinduism, uh, Jacob Roshman from Judaism, Fardeen Mohammadi from Islam, and Rebecca Austin from Christianity. Thank you. goodbyes and reflection. In this time, we've come to realize that it's not just the grades or the classes. It's the people, the discovery of your values, and the instilling of cultural tolerance. A passage from the Upanishads quotes, the aim of real education should be self-realization, realization of the spiritual values of the soul. For years, we have worked hard, and today we celebrate. But celebration is also a time for reflection. What did we do well, and what could we have done better? I encourage you to think deeply on your time here and to define your story for yourself, to become a symbol for something important to you, to remain genuine, honest, and kind, and no matter what you encounter, to always remain optimistic. You spent your time here learning about the world. As you move beyond Vanderbilt, it's time that the world learns something about you. My question to you is, what will that be? Thank you. Good morning. It's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Vanderbilt's Jewish community. We read in Deuteronomy, The Lord our God spoke to us at Sinai, saying, You have long enough surrounded this mountain. Turn away and take your journey. Sinai, the site of God's revelation to the children of Israel, was a formative location in the lives of the Jewish people. And yet, they were told to move on. Vanderbilt has been a place of revelation for us, a place where we have learned and grown. But our time has come to move on. We must go out into the world and enrich the lives of those around us with all that we have learned here. As we begin this journey, May God always direct our steps and lead us 
in life, joy, and peace. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, mercy, and blessings of God be upon you all. I welcome and congratulate you on the behalf of Vanderbilt's Muslim community. God says in the Quran, فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَ Verily, with hardship comes ease. We have all endured hard years of study, but in our time here we made unforgettable memories, strong friendships, and expanded our horizons. Commencement is an end to an era and an opening to a new world. So I share my thoughts in the form of a Muslim prayer. Our Lord, you are the all-knowing, the most merciful. Bestow upon us the wisdom to appreciate what we have, the faith to endure hardships, and the patience to see the benefit of our works. We ask for your protection, love, mercy, and forgiveness as we seek to become closer to you via our separate paths. Ameen wa assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you. My favorite thing about Vanderbilt is living in intentional community based on living and learning together. I would like to share the prayer of St. Francis as we leave this community to join others. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to lo be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Well, welcome class of 2014. My name is Carol Kimball. I'm president of the Vanderbilt Alumni Association. And on behalf of alumni around the world, welcome to our ranks. As you look to your left and right, in front of and behind you, you see the 1,600 people who have comprised your most important network during your time at Vanderbilt. And yet your classmates represent a very small fraction of your entire Vanderbilt network. There are 125,000 of us in 141 countries around the world who know just what it feels like to be in your shoes today. We too have left the university bubble and burst forth into life after Vanderbilt. Just as we were prepared for our journey, you too are prepared. You have acquired the knowledge and skills to be successful in this fast-changing world. You have developed relationships which will endure for the rest of your life, and you have a vast alumni network that really wants you to be successful. Why? Because when you're successful in the classroom, in your communities, and on your jobs, you actually increase the value of our education. So today, as alumni, you join us literally as equity stakeholders in this great institution. You have spent your time and your resources, in some cases your parents' resources, in a four-year-long development project. And like all good investors, you're going to want to see the value of your investment grow. So how do you do that? I think there are three things. Continue to uphold the qualities of community and civility which inspired Commodore Vanderbilt's founding gift. Strive for excellence and integrity in everything you do. And importantly, take personal responsibility for the ongoing success of this great institution. When you do that, you will be expressing your gratitude to the thousands and thousands of alumni who came before you who made your experience at Vanderbilt possible. And you will be paving the way for future generations of Commodores to experience all that Vanderbilt has to offer. 
So just as you have increased the value of my education, others will increase the value of yours. And I promise you the Alumni Association is here to help. So whether you're studying, traveling, looking for a job, or just trying to make friends in a new city, think Vanderbilt because we're there. From Boston to Beijing, Dallas to Delhi, New York to New Zealand, think Vanderbilt because we're there too. But you have to take the initiative to connect into us. Join the Vanderbilt LinkedIn page, sign up for VU Connect, attend chapter events in your hometowns or in the cities in which you work. Come back to campus for homecoming and reunion. There are myriad ways to connect. It's only when you connect that you tap into the power of 125,000 of us who want you to be successful. So good luck, you're ready, conquer and prevail. We are Vanderbilt for life. Good morning. My name is Julie Babbage, and this year I had the privilege of serving as your 2014 Senior Class Fund Overall Chair. And it's an honor to present on behalf of the Senior Class Fund this morning. The Senior Class Fund is a senior-led giving campaign where we are able to leave our mark by giving back to the university. By making a gift of any amount to any area of campus, it is our way to say thank you to a place that has given us so much over the past four years. I'd like to begin by thanking my outstanding fellow officers, Aaron Andrews, Kirsten Crossfield, Sarah Chu, Nihar Patel, and Nick Wells, as well as our wonderful 68-person committee. We all knew that the class of 2013 was a tough act to follow with a record of 67% of seniors giving back. Still, we wanted our class to surpass their goal and leave our own legacy at Vanderbilt. Well, now our numbers are in, so I can finally stop sending class email updates on the campaign progress, which I know that you all read and love. While our goal was lofty, I'm thrilled to announce that 1,095 seniors rose to the challenge and made a gift to the university setting a new record of 70% participation. Thanks to everyone who helped us achieve this huge accomplishment. And with that, I would like to ask Chancellor Zeppos to please come join me at the podium. On behalf of the class of 2014, I would like to present you with that banner containing our signatures and tracking our amazing journey to 70%. We are so grateful for the opportunities you have helped create for us, and we look forward to a long-lasting relationship with the university. Thank you, Chancellor Zeppos. I just want to thank Julie and the committee for their extraordinary leadership. They're busy with so many other things as they move toward commencement, and I want to thank each and every student for this great contribution. I think it sends a message about the generous spirit that Vanderbilt stands for, but I think even more importantly, I think it affirms the extraordinary experience that Vanderbilt aspires to for young people. So thank you very much. Chancellor Zeppos, Provost McCarty, Dean Bandis, distinguished guests, faculty, families, and fellow students, I'm honored to be with all of you on this memorable day. Four years ago, our class entered the university's storied gates, passed the statue of Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt, 
and officially became a part of the Vanderbilt community. We had just arrived on campus, overwhelmed by the new environment, but warmly welcomed by over 1,000 upperclassmen students who exemplified the Vanderbilt spirit, the spirit of service. As first years, we pledged to follow in this tradition of service by participating in common service projects and living as a community. On the commons, we learned to engage with our housemates, explore academic subjects, and expand our involvement on campus. As sophomores, we moved on. We joined organizations. We became servant leaders, and we were eager to do the smallest of tasks in order to help our organization succeed. As juniors, we learned to serve others through leadership positions and volunteer experiences, which included service trips, philanthropy events, and community service. To many of us, Vanderbilt also gave us the opportunity to travel abroad, absorb another culture, and return with new perspectives that would enrich our campus. And this year, we served as the wise elders of campus, providing advice and mentorship to younger students, helping shape the next generation at Vanderbilt to ensure that our tradition of service will live on. As friends, we helped each other make the most of Vanderbilt's unique learning environment and vibrant campus life. Today, we're all blessed to achieve a lifelong goal together, graduation from Vanderbilt. And tomorrow, we'll exit Vanderbilt's gate for the final time as undergraduates, entering a new phase of our lives with strong credentials, a proven ability to be lifelong learners, experience working outside our comfort zone, and a willingness to serve. This is now our time to apply what we learned at Vanderbilt in the greater world. We must seek to become great citizens for the benefit of our society, our school, and our country. We must show Vanderbilt's spirit of service by putting service to others, our families, and personal happiness before pure monetary gain. And by embracing Vanderbilt's spirit of service, we will leave an indelible mark on our new communities, just as we believe we have done so here on campus. It is now my honor to introduce an individual who has stood out at our great university for the past 27 years. Chancellor Nicholas Zeppos joined the Vanderbilt community in 1987 as an assistant professor in the law school and was named the eighth Chancellor of Vanderbilt in 2008. Under his leadership, Vanderbilt exper has experienced an extraordinary transformation and an unparalleled level of academic excellence. During his tenure, the creation of the Martha Rivers Ingram Commons and the Warren and Moore Colleges has enriched Vanderbilt's living, learning, residential experience. In addition, the vast expansion of Vanderbilt's financial aid program has allowed many of us to graduate debt-free. The Chancellor's ability to inspire students to dream big has been invaluable to our university, and his visionary leadership will continue to shape Vanderbilt into a world-renowned research university. Please join me in welcoming our Chancellor, Chancellor Nicholas Zeppos. Thank you, Isaac, for that warm and uh, perhaps hyperbolic introduction, but I will accept it with great gratitude, my friend. I am so pleased to expend, extend a warm welcome to our outstanding graduates, their families, their friends, and all of us who have joined us today, including so many valued members of our university community as we celebrate Senior Day. I do want to note that Vanderbilt is unusual in the partnership it has with its students and student government, and that Isaac has done an exceptional job representing the varied complex interests of the student body and working closely with me and so many others to really take Vanderbilt forward. So Isaac, congratulations, thank you. I also want to thank our students who participated in this uh, uh, event. Uh, Sid Sapru is the president of the Interfaith Council. I want to thank him. I want to thank Shopa Mokshagundam, Jacob Grossman, Fardeen Mohammadi, and Rebecca Austin for their participation. Let me, let, me, let me emphasize 
that the heartfelt blessings from so many different perspectives not only illuminate these many traditions and tenets of your individual faiths that are found on our campus, I believe they shine a bright light on our sense, said so well by Sid, on shared humanity and humbleness within the vast perspective of our wondrous universe. Vanderbilt's greatness is defined by our people, and we celebrate the varied faiths that make us unique, as well as the profoundly shared values of friendship, inclusion, community, and civility that truly bind us together as a university family. I would also like to thank my good friend and president of the Vanderbilt Alumni Association, Carol Kimball, for her wise stewardship and leadership of the university's more than 127,000 alumni. She does an exceptional job of bringing to the university the perspectives, the interests of these global citizens in moving Vanderbilt forward. Again, I want to thank Julie Babbage for her leadership in chairing the Senior Class Fund, and again to thank all the seniors who contributed to this generous gift. And I believe there's still time for those who haven't. In giving to the areas of the university that you individually care about, that transformed your lives, that made you who you are and will continue to grow into, your philanthropy affirms the meaningfulness of these programs and it truly strengthens the Vanderbilt experience for all those who will follow in your footsteps. Following the philanthropic vision of our founder, Cornelius Vanderbilt, and his gift to establish this university that would contribute to strengthen the ties of humanity, 140 years later, we every day affirm and celebrate our mission of bettering our greater society. During commencement week, we celebrate that noble goal embodied with our students' great achievements. But Senior Day allows us a unique opportunity to commemorate an individual, an individual who has dedicated her career, her life, her many talents to caring and compassionate work that makes a positive difference in the lives of many, many others. Upon this special person, we bestow the Nichols Chancellor's Medal. This medal was created and endowed by our distinguished alumnus Ed Nichols and his wife Janice Nichols in loving memory of Ed's parents, Edward Carmack Nichols and Lucille Hamby Nichols. Janice and Ed are with us today, and I would like to express grateful thanks for establishing and continuing this tradition that speaks to the heart of who we are as a university. Thank you, Janice and Ed. <laughs> On behalf of the entire Vanderbilt community, I am honored to present the 2014 Nichols Chancellor's Medal to Dr. Regina M. Benjamin. As, as the 18th United States Surgeon General, Dr. Benjamin served our country by educating Americans on health care and prevention. Under her expert leadership, she oversaw the operational command of 6,700 public health officials. Dr. Benjamin received her bachelor's degree from Xavier University and earned two advanced degrees, an MD from the University of Alabama at Birmingham and an MBA from Tulane University. She attended Morehouse School of Medicine and she is the recipient of 22 honorary degrees. After completing her family, me family medicine residency in Macon, Georgia, Dr. Benjamin established a rural health clinic and served patients in Bayou La Batrie, Alabama. Despite the damage and destruction of Hurricane George in 1998, Hurricane Katrina in 2005, and a devastating fire in 2006, she determinedly kept the doors of the clinic open to ensure all the people, all the people of this underserved community had access to quality health care. 
Dr. Benjamin is the former Associate Dean for Rural Health at the University of South Alabama College of Medicine and past chair of the Federation of State Medical Boards of the United States. She is a member of the Institute of Medicine, a nonprofit organization of the National Academy of Sciences that works outside of government to provide unbiased, objective, authoritative advice to decision makers and the public. She was the United States re recipient of the Nelson Mandela Award for Health and Human Rights, and she has appropriately received a MacArthur Genius Award. During her four years of service as Surgeon General, Dr. Benjamin focused her attention on the important area of prevention. Based on her vision paper, the Surgeon General's vision for a healthy and fit nation, the national prevention strategy provided us with an unprecedented opportunity to shift our country from a focus on sickness and disease to one based on wellness and prevention. As a trusted authority on public health issues, a champion of ensuring that all Americans, all Americans have access to and means to obtain health care and preventative, preventative services, Dr. Benjamin exemplifies the very, very best in humanitarian scholarship. Her message presents to all of us a tremendous opportunity, but particularly to our graduating seniors, to learn to learn from her inspiring educational path and her contributions, enormous, to the betterment of our society. She is so richly deserving of the Nichols Chancellor's Medal, and it is my great honor to present it to her today. Dr. Benjamin, we applaud your work and your commitment to making our world simply a much better place. Award. I will say, I've never met Einstein, but I've met other geniuses. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's pretty nice, if you can see it. So good morning. I think it's still morning. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, people think you're smart when you have that MacArthur Genius Award, but I think I'm still waiting for the genius part to happen, and I think it'll happen, hopefully it'll happen later. <laughs> Thank you, Chancellor Zeppos, to graduates, families, friends, faculty, and staff for this very special honor. You know, it's very special, and it means a lot, especially because you, the class of 2014, selected me as your choice. That's very humbling. And it, it really is very special. You know, as Vanderbilt graduates, you will forever be known for your academic excellence and your achievements. For the fact that you were actually accepted to Vanderbilt is an achievement. But today I want to remind you and your families of the service side of your Vanderbilt values and what experience that you've had here and the humanitarian values that have prepared you to follow Cornelius Vanderbilt's vision for you to strengthen the ties that should exist between all sections of our common country, between the rich and the poor, the educated and undereducated, the Christian and non-Christian, and so on and so forth. You are now prepared to go out and change the world. You're prepared to make a difference. So today I thought I would just share with you some of my personal experiences and hopefully stimulate your thoughts how you can make a difference. And I thought I'd start by telling you how I got involved in my community. When I was an intern, I attended the Medical Association of Georgia's annual meeting and one of the intense issues that was being debated was that sexually transmitted diseases needed to be taught in medical school. I stood up in a room with maybe three rows of people, and I told them I'd never seen certain diseases except in a textbook, and I thought there was a need. The resolution passed, and the Georgia delegation forwarded that resolution 
to the American Medical Association. And they also sent me to the AMA conference to speak to that resolution. And the resolution passed. And within six months, every medical school in this country was encouraged to include sexually transmitted diseases as part of their core curriculum. I learned that one person can make a difference, whether it's in medical policy or in medical practice. And I learned that I could make a difference in medical practice when the National Health Service Corps sent me to Biola Battery. It's a pretty place, but it's a poor place. I found a community of working poor, too poor to afford medical care, but too rich to qualify for Medicaid. I liked the people, I liked the community, and I wanted to practice medicine there. But I quickly learned that practicing medicine wasn't just sewing up to shark bites. I had to deal with the land sharks, the regulators, the reviewers, all the paperwork, and all the things that go along with it. So I decided to stay involved in every organization I could to help bring services to our community. The medical societies, the United Way, the Red Cross, Girl Scouts, Chamber of Commerce, any organization that would work with us to bring services to the community. But I also learned that patients had problems that my prescription pad by itself couldn't solve. Things like adequate housing, especially after Katrina, employment opportunities, clean water. I have a lot of patients that I want to share a couple of stories with you, but I want to tell you about one, um, Ms. Smith, and that's her HIPAA name, by the way. That's not her real name. <laughs> Mrs. Smith um, is a, well, let me stop and just tell you what our community's demographics is like. We have a very diverse community, about 60% white shrimpers um, who've lived in the community all their lives and generations. Then we have about 30% Asian, Vietnamese, Cambodian, Laotian, and about 10% African American and other. Ms. Smith happened to be an African American lady, um, about this high and about that wide. And Ms. Smith called me on a Saturday and she says, Dr. Benjamin, um, my, my back is really hurting. Um, I went to that specialist that you sent me to, and he told me I have a slipped disc, and he told me I needed to lose some weight. And I've been trying, I really have, but the Tylenol, that your ibuprofen that you and is, gave me is not working. It's, it's not strong enough. Can you call me something in stronger? I said, sure, I can call you in something stronger, but you've got to come and see me on Monday or Tuesday. And she said, she says, I will, I, I promise you I will. So sure enough, on, I called her in something, on Tuesday I walk in the exam room, and there she is leaning over the exam table in so much pain that she couldn't sit down. And I said, Miss Smith, you know, did the medicine I called you in, did it help at all? And she says, well, Dr. Benjamin, I didn't get it. I said, what do you mean you didn't get it? She says, I couldn't afford it. I said, but you work at the school system. You work in the school system. You, you work there. You have insurance. What do you mean you didn't get it? She says, I didn't have the copay. But I get paid on Friday, and I promise you I'll get it. And so I stepped out of the room, and I talked to my nurse, Nell. We call her Granny Nell, and ask her to go across the street to Jim, our pharmacist, to get the medicine for her. And so when Nell brought it back, I went back in the exam room and I said, Miss Smith, you're obviously in a lot of pain. I want you to start taking your medicine. Here's your medicine. And at that moment, her eyes welled up with tears. And she says, oh, Dr. Benjamin, I'm so embarrassed. I didn't want you to have to do that. And at that moment, I realized I had taken her dignity from her. And that cultural competency has nothing to do with the color of your skin. It has to do with allowing people to maintain their dignity. And so I had to figure out how to get out of it. So I basically talked to her about the fact that we have a small pot of money, particularly after Katrina, that we call our medication fund. And that we bought the medicine out of that. 
and that if she wanted to pay it back on Friday, she could, but she didn't have to. And so she was okay with that. And as I was leaving the room, she said, oh, by the way. And her oh, by the way was, can I get a work excuse? I said, sure. You want to start taking your medicine today? It's Tuesday. Take it for a couple of days. You want to go back Thursday or Friday? She says, oh, no. We have to strip those floors tonight. Here was a woman who is in so much pain that she can't sit down, but she was willing to strip the wax off the floors so that our kids could go to school in a clean environment. And so it was because of her and others like her that I was willing to leave my practice of 23 years to become the 18th Surgeon General of the United States, to be a voice for her, to be at the table on her and others like hers benefit. It was that time, those four years were extraordinary years of policy making and health promotion and protecting the public's health and through my command of the United States Public Health Officers, which of course is a branch of the military, um, we focused on prevention. And as the Chancellor said, prevention was the basis of my, my entire um, platform as Surgeon General and still is. Um, I was especially proud of the, having to establish the first ever national prevention strategy. And that's a roadmap for a healthy and fit nation. And uh, Ms. Nichols earlier today asked me what was some of the things that, that I'm especially proud of, and that was one. And she also asked about women. And so one of the things that I really remember fondly, although the newspapers weren't always nice about it, was that when we talk about obesity and exercising and health, I mentioned the fact that when I ask women you know, some women, why aren't you exercising more? They say, well, I just got my hair done. I'm not going to sweat my hair back. So we did a, an entire campaign on exercising, and we gave awards for um, the most exercise-friendly hairstyle. We went to a competition um, at the largest hair show in, in the, actually in the world. It's held in Atlanta each year, and that competition has grown each year. And the, we engaged the um, hairstylists to become ambassadors for health because as they say they are they have the patients in the chair and they see their their hairstylists more than they see their doctors and so that campaign has really taken off giving people control of their own health you know while I left the position last summer I didn't leave the mission I still have those campaigns going on we have one you're gonna hear about called everybody walks trying to get America walking walking for fun walking for exercise walking for transportation just getting up moving and walking and having a good time um, one of the places out in California calls their uh, weekly walks in their community a soul stroll they come out for the soul stroll but to have a good time but if we're gonna walk we have to have walkable communities and so we have to all get engaged to get our communities to be walkable and safe. And of course, smoking. No Surgeon General can get in front of a microphone without talking about smoking. This is the 50th anniversary of the first Surgeon General's report on, on tobacco. And yet, we've come a long way with smoking. However, those rates of decline in smoking have stabilized and they're starting to rise again. But they're rising in our young people. Every single day in this country, 1,200 people die from cigarette smoke. Each one of those deaths has been replaced by two young smokers. We call them replacement smokers. 90% of all smokers start before the age of 18, and 99% start before the age of 26. If we can just get our next generation not to take their first cigarette before the age of 26, they, that generation can become tobacco-free. And so that's why we're launching these um, tobacco-free college campuses. Um, because there's so much marketing, so many other things that you're seeing in the news now, e-cigarettes and others. But I'll stop, because I could talk to you about smoking forever. Um, which also reminds me of the fact that if my mother were here, she would be so very proud. 
but she died from lung cancer due to cigarette smoke. You know, I'm continuing to do those mass messages nationally, um, but I'm also now on a college campus uh, as an endowed chair at Xavier University in New Orleans and also back in the clinic. So I share my time between our clinic and, and the university. But it's so important to remain a part of your community. As you graduate tomorrow, and whether you go on to graduate from professional school or enter the job market, remember to remain active in your community. And this was brought home to me so concretely several years ago. In 1998, Hurricane George's made landfall on the Gulf Coast, causing over $100 million in damage to the Alabama coast alone. Our clinic was destroyed, and my nurse, Nell, as I mentioned, and I saw patients from my pickup truck doing house calls over the next two years till we could get the clinic resources enough to rebuild it. And we rebuilt it on higher ground and up on stilts. But in the meantime, I was able to save our drenched paper records and carefully drying them out in the sun. And although I wanted an electronic record at the time, we, money was tight, and so we had to choose between paying, getting a, paying a light bill or buying an electronic record. And of course, the light bill got paid. But then in 2005, Hurricane Katrina hit Viola Battery, bringing a 25-foot surge of water and Biola Battery was hit pretty hard. In a population of 2,500 people, 2,000 lost their homes, and they had no livable homes. And the economy in the town was destroyed when the shrimp boats were up in the trees, in pine trees, and again, the clinic was destroyed. And as before, I went out to look for patients to do the house calls, but they didn't have any homes. Many of them were living in shelter, a shelter, and some had tents on the ground. So we set up a makeshift clinic on the stage of the auditorium that was serving as a shelter. And we provided the basic primary care. Many of the patients lost their medicines, their diabetic supplies, their asthma machines. They lost them in a storm. They had nothing and we had nothing. So I cut copy paper in four pieces. Um, to make a prescription pad. And I wrote the prescriptions, and on the bottom of it, I wrote to the pharmacist, just bill me. Because even those who had insurance didn't know where their cards were. They had no money, but they needed their medicines now. And the patients and I really had to rely on memory to figure out what their histories were. But the community came together, and they helped each other. And we, with the help of a lot of volunteers, we rebuilt the building. And we moved our new furniture, equipment, and our once again dried out charts into the newly renovated building in order to open the day after New Year's. Um, I was hard on the staff saying, we got to get the vacuum cleaner. We got to get all this stuff out of the trailer and put it in the clinic. But that night on New Year's Eve, in the wee hours in the morning, the building burned down and it burned to the ground, burning those charts that we had dried out twice. And we were devastated. And probably, I was devastated probably more sore than, more sore than the storm for some reason. But the community, they were wonderful. The patients came by, gave us hugs and cried. And one elderly patient sent a note to me by her granddaughter. It was an envelope. And in the envelope was $7. And the note said, to help rebuild a clinic. And I knew she couldn't afford it. And I said to myself, if she can find $7, I'm going to find the rest. And we did. And I knew I wasn't alone. The community and the patients were there for me. And they will be there for you if you're part of that community as well, whatever profession you go into. You know, it's often said, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. One of the most valuable things you can ever give is of yourself. So please don't miss out the opportunity to have that feeling, whether it's at home or at work, that you've given of yourself. 
you know, I want to switch a little bit and just say while I'm proud of all the colleges here in the schools, I want to take a brief moment to speak directly to the medical school, the nursing school, and other health professionals. Because I don't want to miss this opportunity to let you know how blessed we are as a profession. There's no other profession like it. I'm biased, but um, there is no other profession like it. There's nothing like the look on a mother's face when you tell her her baby's going to be okay. Whether she, the baby is three or 33, that look on that mother's face is going to be the same. And our patients trust us. They truly trust us. A young woman who's being physically abused will tell her clinician her deepest, darkest secrets before she tells her priest, her minister, or her rabbi. She'll tell us that because she trusts us. And a mother will put her baby, her infant, in the arms of a strange person she's never met because she trusts us. And an infant is oftentimes the first hands that an infant feels as it enters this earth are your hands. And it's oftentimes the last hands that an elderly person feels before they leave this earth is your hands. We are truly blessed as a profession. But with that gift comes responsibility. Don't take your, your profession lightly. And I want to say to all of you in the health professions, welcome to the profession. But with all the graduates, no matter what your major is, you have a responsibility to lead. You're already leaders. Whether you realize it or not, you are leaders. And I've participated in some of the national leadership programs trying to learn the, you know, what type of leadership styles are better. But I want to share with you two of my favorite leadership styles. The very first one is the servant leader. We all know who the servant leader is. It's that person who steps up, serves, does something not for the glory, not for the praise, but just because it needs to be done. You see servant leaders throughout the Bible. You see them in your organizations. You see them in your church. We saw Julie and her um, committee step up to raise the funds that was just presented. They didn't have to. It's, that's called service. Um, we've seen it in Cornelius Vanderbilt. He didn't have to give a million dollars to create this university in 1873. But he felt there was a need and he had a vision and he just did it. And we have two extraordinary examples here with us today, Ed and Janice Nichols. Um, I know they were mentioned earlier, but I want to just say this, thank them for this Nichols Chancellor Medal and the cash prize that comes along with it. And it, they didn't have to establish this endowment in honor of Ed's father and to promote the humanitarian va values but they did. The other part of this endowment also provides this critical funding for Vanderbilt students on a needs-based um, financial aid to participate in service learnings abroad. It opens up the eyes in the, of these young people when they go abroad and serve. So I would like to thank Ed and Janice Nichols for this award, particularly the cash portion of the award and to let them know that 100% of that cash award will go to the Bayou Clinic, which greatly needs it. But I'm gonna keep the medal. So, you know, um, the other style of leadership is what I call leadership from behind. I kind of made that up, but I, I call it leadership behind, from behind. It's when we rise to a level of success that we reach back and pull others up with us. And a good leader will do that. But a great leader won't stop there. A great leader will push that person out in front of them. Let them know, as the young people say, that you've got their back. 
that if they're, they're not gonna stumble, if they're gonna fall, you're there for them. And that's what the faculty and the staff and your parents have been doing for you. And now you will have an opportunity to do it for others. A few years ago, I ran this program called AHEC, and we have one here in Tennessee too, but it's a program to get young kids interested in health careers. So we take these kids on, on little tours of university campuses. And this particular school we went to in Alabama, and I won't tell you which university, but we, we took them to a school. And it was an eight-year-old girl, a young white girl, who was just awed, and she kept saying, it's so beautiful. The buildings are so beautiful. When I grow up, do you think they'll let me clean? And I wanted to say to her, I didn't want her to think cleaning was bad. So basically what I told her is that you can come here, you can sit in those chairs, because it was an auditorium, like, and you can get an education, and when you do finish, you can start your own company, and you can get a contract and clean every building in the state because you've gotten your degree. And I tell you that to, to make sure you understand that everybody doesn't have the opportunities that you have. It's up to you to make sure that they do get those opportunities. They deserve the same opportunities. That's what the um, Nicholas Chancellor's Endowment is about. That's what yours can be as well. I want you to encourage other people to get more education. Um, I have with me here, who came with me is, she's gonna kill me for this, but Julie Taylor, and I don't know where she is. Um, Julie, stand up wherever you are. <laughs> Which side? I still don't see her. At any rate, oh, there she is. She didn't, she's shy. Julie was my assistant. She helped us open the mail. She started um, answering, um, you know, phone calls, opening the mail going to the bank. She started with me, and she progressively got better and better and learned, and now she's the executive director of the Bayou Clinic. She has kept that clinic going all of my time in Washington, and, and now I'm watching her mentor others, young people that we're starting to hire to bring in, seeing how she's starting to do that. And so, Julie, I've never publicly said it, but thank you, and I'm very proud of you. You know, you're never going to know who's watching you. People are watching you when you don't even think they are. Um, I've had a couple of examples, but I'm going to just tell you one. And when I was on the AMA Board of Trustees, um, actually, wrong one, but anyway, I'll tell you two. I was on the AMA Board of Trustees, and I was the only woman on the board, or, yeah, only woman, and the only African American. And the board would meet prior to the House of Delegates, which is this big convention, and we would leave our things on the table sometime. So I went down, it was sort of in a, basement and I went down and to get something off of my table that we had talked about earlier that day and so there was a elderly janitor that was straightening up and he said to me ma'am can I say something to you I said sure he says I just want you to know that we're very proud of you we all know you're there even the um, ladies in the kitchen wanted me to let you know we're proud of you I even told my granddaughter about you you never know who's watching you just by being there, just by making sure you're doing well and being good at what you do. Your presence matters. I used to always tell um, reporters who'd call, and they, you know, I think I got my picture in a paper or something for some reason, and they call and they want to ask you the same things that are already in the paper and I would be annoyed until one day I got an envelope in the mail. And in that envelope, it was a manila envelope, it was filled with letters from a second grade class. And each one of them said, I saw your picture in the paper, I wanna be a doctor just like you. 
And I realized that those interviews, those awards, were not about me. It's about whether one of those kids becomes a doctor, one of them becomes anything they want to be, or the fact that they just want to try. It's about that. When you graduate tomorrow, and your name is going to be in your hometown paper, the things you're going to do, you're going to inspire somebody. You're going to be inspiring your little brother, your little sister, your cousin, the kid down the street. When your parents talk about you and brag about you, they're going to be inspiring others. So it's res be responsible. And I know we're giving you these heavy obligations, but you're up to it. You're prepared. I want you to take time for yourself. As the doctor in me, I have to tell you, while you're going out saving the world, making a difference, I want you to exercise, rest, have fun, play. You know, on the flight here yesterday, the flight attendant said, put your own face mask on before attempting to help others. You got to take care of yourselves. And by doing that, you are setting an example. And finally, I want to end um, with a poem, and it's by an unknown author, um, but it's entitled God Minute, and it goes like this. I have only just a minute, only 60 seconds in it, forced upon me, can't refuse it, didn't seek it, didn't choose it, but it's up to me to use it. I must suffer if I lose it, give account if I abuse it. Just a tiny little minute, yet eternity is in it. I hope that you will take your God minute and make a difference. Congratulations, class of 2014. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Was okay. <laughs> that was spectacular. So generous. Oh. Those are beautiful stories. I love you talking to the doctors. Yeah. Yes. Because, uh, Thank you so much, Dr. Benjamin, for that inspiring talk and that incredible act of generosity. You are a Nichols humanitarian in acts and deeds and words and in all you do. Thank you very much. Now, um, commencement activities are, of course, tomorrow, but we have a lot of great things happening between now and tomorrow morning. Um, I would encourage you, uh, the students and family members and uh, to perhaps go attend some of the lectures that we have this afternoon by some of our fabulous faculty. And they're in Wilson Hall. Enjoy the day, and I will see you bright and early in the morning. Thank you so much.